This episode of Game On is brought to you by Ford, featuring Curve Control to help protect against crashes on curves. Look for Curve Control available on the 2013 Ford Taurus, and you can learn more at Ford.com slash cars slash Taurus. Okay, it's Sunday, March 11th, and I've slept with so many people in Mass Effect 3, my fingers are walking bow-legged. Brian and Veronica deliver a Mass Effect 3 review with unexpected force, like a reaper. We sneak our way next to Jeb and Notch from Mojang to discuss all things Minecraft like a creeper. Civilization Revolution for iPad Review. It's a game that's been awesome since I owned a, a beeper. That's all I can think of. It's time for Game On! We are on for Game On. I'm Brian Brushwood. And I'm Veronica Belmont, and I am a total hypocrite that purchased the Zero Day Mass Effect 3 DLC. You, I can't believe it. You caved? Eh. <laughs> you realize, you realize I intentionally, I bought the game on PC, even though I could have played it on the Xbox. We already had a copy. I bought it on PC because I wanted the PC experience, and I intentionally did not buy the DLC just to prove that it didn't affect it. How, how do you feel now that you bought it? Well, I feel fine. I haven't found the, I haven't gone on the DLC mission yet. I thought that was though. like an early thing. I, maybe I missed it, and I can't go back. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't found the new character, the new crew member yet, so well, I'm still I, working on that. Okay, without being too spoilery, mm -hmm. like, there is an artifact where it would be really useful to have a Prothean to interpret it for you, but apparently, if you have the Prothean, you have the one Prothean who's like, oh man, that's science stuff. I don't know nothing about that. I don't know what Prothean you could be talking about, oh. Brian, <laughs> that would be spoilery for our audience. It's not spoilery. It's, in the, it's the description of the DLC. Okay. I'm, I mean, All I right. knew that. You didn't spoil it for okay. me, but I'm just trying to be protective of my people, my Fair peoples. Enough. Fair enough. And of course, we're going to have an inside look into Mass Effect 3. And we have associate producer Billy Buskell on the show tonight. And just a reminder, we record live every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at live.twit.tv. Be sure to re to tweet reactions to this episode at TwitGameOn. The next 47 minutes are an experiment, but you have to pay attention. <laughs> Unless you tweet us funny or interesting reactions, our own producer, OMG Chad, does not get to talk at the end of the show. So we have to make him famous. Please use hashtag Chad 2012. Yeah, so when this dog and pony show is over, we are saddling up for a root and tootin' round of Shut Up and Play, our LAN party where the cast and crew of Game On Play with y'all. Tonight, Minecraft gets all up in your craw. Hey man, because you were too busy writing poems about solar flares, here's a week's worth of news and the system update. Bad news if you're chomping at the bit to play a PvP arena in the new Diablo 3, even after it launches, which is still a mystery, it will be without the multiplayer feature. D3 game director Jay Wilson took to the internet this week to proclaim that PvP Arena would be scratched at launch so that the title wouldn't be delayed any further. As for the big question, when will Diablo 3 be released, Wilson added that they are, quote, counting down the days until they announce a date. Okay, this is very early. The game doesn't come out until 2013, but EA showed off footage of the new SimCity, and it looks awesome. In a GDC talk showing off the Glassbox engine, we got our first look at world building, fires, and more. Other awesome developments include intricate animations triggered by the slightest rule changes. Most excitingly, co-op play is definitely coming. There is no specific release date yet for SimCity 5. Unless we live in an actual SimCity controlled universe, in which case we are just waiting for the operator to set one for us. Do you really want a console for Steam games? Well, then the rumors last week of just such a device moving its way through development surely gave you a smile. Too bad they're not real. Valve's PR guru Doug Lombardi tells Kotaku that the hardware development in question is in reference to Valve's big picture mode UI, which makes it easier to plug your PC into a TV. As for the possibility of a Steam console ever coming to fruition, Lombardi said it will be a long time before his company ships any real hardware or gives us press accounts. I made that last part up. Apple announced their new iPad, which will not be called iPad 3, but rather just iPad, like the first iPad, but not the second iPad, which was called iPad 2. 
Confused? Well, the only reason we're mentioning it is because Apple continues to push the tablet as a premier gaming machine, demonstrating titles from Epic and Namco optimized with the device's new A5X chip with quad-core graphics and retina display. Apple even went so far as to boast that the device has better resolution and memory capabilities than the PS3 or Xbox consoles. Also, we like to call it iPad the third. Deep in the heart of Texas this week, BioWare held the Star Wars The Old Republic Guild Summit and debuted a ton of new info coming soon for the MMO. The biggest headline news, the Legacy System. Long pumped up as a game changer for tour fans, here's what it means. As you hit major milestones in gameplay, you'll unlock specific abilities for every character you have on that server. For example, hit a milestone as a Sith Lord, and now Force Choke is available to your bounty hunter. Didn't think they could do it? I find your lack of faith disturbing. Dude, it was amazing to actually go to the Guild Summit. It is so obvious. And, of course, I live in Austin, and they're right there in Austin, so it was easy to show up. But it is amazing to watch the highly concentrated effort for them to woo away the MMO community from Blizzard. Because not only, as far as I know, especially right now, uh, Blizzard just cancer, canceled BlizzCon. Mm-hmm. And, of course, they're, they're now giving away Diablo 3 to say, please stay with World of Warcraft. In the meanwhile... They're doing something over at... Uh, Blizz, BlizzCon is very much about Blizzard telling you how it's going to be, but BioWare is really actively listening. Some of the things they did is, for example, they did a Star Wars trivia event where they broke up into tables. It was like a pub trivia night, and every single ta- t- table had a developer there with them. Oh, wow. And so it, it is obvious from the beginning that they're really listening and they're making announcements that people really care about. Uh, it is... Uh, it, it, I've never seen anything like it. These guys really have their act together, and it'll be interesting to see how this plays out as far as their battle with World of Warcraft. Was it an invite-only thing, or could anyone go? Uh, it was, I believe, invite-only. I went there as a press, so I mm-hmm. just went to kind of watch. But there, but keep in mind, the folks who are there are not press. It's th- These are for the guild. So these are guild leaders. They flew in, uh, for example, your guild, AIE, was represented they flew him <laughs> in it, it was it was fantastic and and people really seem to get a lot out of it i'll be again it'll be interesting to see where, where this happens oh i wish i could have gone too much traveling and, and gdc happening and all everything that was Dude, going this on is with an that. amazing week for it's news. been a crazy week i cannot believe how excited i am about sim city 5 i'm surprised like, as well the news about co-op well i'm not surprised that i'm excited i'm just like i can't wait for it i cannot wait for it i can't wait for it <laughs> I'm, I'm sensing that you're maybe a little bit excited i love sim city <laughs> so much. I love all the Sims. I love all the Sim Cities. I've played every single one of them. I played Sim Tower. I played Sim Copter. I played Sim Farm. I played Sim Ant. You played Sim Ant? Oh, I dreamed Sim Ant. Oh I used God. to. I used to actually. When I was a kid, I would see like figure out strategies and like figure out plans for taking over you still the other like, ant stomp colony. Red ants out of rage. Oh, it was so good. Yeah, I, I freaked out over Sim Ant. I loved it and all like you know planning for for when to do your planting for for Sim Farm and those games are great. And I have been waiting for a new SimCity so you, you for a involved. really long time. So at this point, are you totally not worried about the fact that Will Wright's not involved? I'm, I'm you know, it's it's a little bit con- concerning. I'm yeah. not going to lie and say that it doesn't, like, make me wonder how it's going to turn out, but from what the minuscule amount of what we've seen so far, I'm really excited about yeah. it. And they could, I don't care, it could be... Frankly, the game could be pretty bad, and I would still pay a lot of money for it. I like that moment where you pause. You're like, like, okay, I'm just going to say it. I'll confess it. And I will go. still. I've been trying to find like a SimCity replacement for a really long you've time. You've had a too. whole. You've had a SimCity sized hole in your heart for that needs now. to be filled. If you guys have any recommendations for games that I can play that will fill that temporary void, let me know. But we have much bigger things to talk about. Way this week. bigger news. Yes, there's only one story this week for most of you out there, and that is Mass Effect Three. And Brian and I have foregone food and water to bring you our review in this week's edition of the score. Okay, so I want to first make a caveat that I have not finished the game yet. So this is more in are you, of my review thus far. Um, oh, gosh. I don't know, actually. I haven't You've got to be like 14 or 20. You, oh, were, easily. you were five hours in. Yeah, I've been playing a lot, and I've done a lot of multiplayer, And uh, but the single-player mode is really grabbing me. Um, okay, so, so I'm only, uh, again, for the caveat, I'm only six hours in at this point mm-hmm. for the PC experience. This is one of those games that I, I think I want to like go back and revisit a few times like in the upcoming episodes to see how my opinions change or how things evolve, um, because it is just such an expansive game. I find 
find it hard to even think how we're going to fit all of this information into just one episode of the show. Um, but anyway, I'm playing as a sentinel, which uses a combination of tech and biotic abilities, um, as well as some really great close combat, like uh, fighting stuff. You know, you can explode your tech armor and, and use that as a kind of AOE ability as well. Um, but you can also use it to help with damage. Um, if you haven't played the first two games, I suggest that you do so. It's I'm going to try to be as unspoilery as possible, but there are some things that kind of pick up from the earlier games. But, you know, that. Well, and I, I will say that uh, in anticipation of Mass Effect 3, I went back and bought again Mass Effect 1 just so I could play oh, it. Right, on we PC. talked about that, yeah. It's, it's shocking how well all of these hold up. I mean, the storytelling is phenomenal, and the engine and the, and the core dynamic, is, uh, gameplay mechanic, is fantastic. So if you've been following the story at all, you know that your mission in this game is to stop the Reapers. I mean, they are. Save their, Earth. Save Earth, save the save galaxy, the universe, save yeah. the universe, save everything. I mean, you've got Turian and Krogan potentially working together. You have to bring together the different races the different cultures that are out there in the universe and and make them all work together somehow to fight the Reaper threat. Right, and it's obvious from the very core mechanic that your job is to build a coalition. And it's really mm -hmm. an interesting twist because I there, there was nothing like this in the previous games where essentially you're like George Washington. You're a, you're a general turned diplomat where you have to step outside of your comfort zone and you have to, all of a sudden, the conversations become extremely important mm -hmm. in order to form alliances. Yeah, you can potentially lose an entire race sure. by just saying the wrong thing. Um, you can, of course, choose to play your shepherd as either a paragon of society or a renegade. Uh, your dialogue options and opportunities Opportunities are going to change with that accordingly. Of we course, should also too. point out that in previous versions, when you do Paragon or Renegade, it acted like it was a continuum, and the mm -hmm. needle would go farther to one side or the other. And as a result, it fr it was frustrating to me because I'd go a lot of work toward Paragon, but then I'd do something Renegade because I couldn't help myself, and I feel like <laughs> I'd lose progress. Whereas this time, they're framing it differently. They have sort of a thermometer scale, mm -hmm. so your social advancement is works either way, whether it's all Paragon or all Renegade. But it short, sort of shows a makeup of how much Paragon versus Renegade. That you have. I would say right now I'm about 80% Paragon, 20% oh, Renegade. How satisfying are those and moments where you just punch people. It's the like, quick no time events words. that keep getting me. I keep doing the Renegade quick time events. Yes. I'm like, oh crap, that, I didn't mean to, I, it was just trigger was, finger too fast. I, I had the worst <laughs> of all worlds because I was sitting there and some nosy reporter comes up and starts asking me a question. And so I moved to punch her. I, she dodges it and then I missed the second quick time event. So I'm just... Wait, the, you punched a reporter? I went to, I went to punch a reporter. Did, did you punch Chobot? No. I think it was a different reporter. Okay, but I didn't but think it's a puncher. I, 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 I went to punch and missed, and then I missed the second time event, so I just was, I'm shepherd on national intergalactic television being uh, like, okay. hey, jerk, oh, I missed, oh, I fell down. Failed. And it was like, yes. I'm I waiting. made a fool of myself. It sucked. Um, but what I also love is that everything you do in the game, including multiplayer, helps to build up your galactic reputation. Right. So I everything you do, whether it's just a simple fetch quest, you know, getting a letter from someone, bringing something to someone, going and helping students somewhere that are trapped, all of this works towards your galactic reputation. Everything you do in multiplayer helps. So you feel like you're working towards this major goal. So let's, Everything is towards the same thing. Let's talk about the combat real quick. Okay. I, I played, I loved all of Mass Effect 2, but mm -hmm. I felt, maybe I, I don't know if I've changed the way I'm playing or if they've tweaked the, the gameplay mechanic, but it feels like the, the combat is a little more challenging this go around, which I think is a great thing. I think it's, it's I, I wouldn't say for me it's more challenging. I think it feels a lot more satisfying. Like there's a, a much more, I hate using this word because it's so overused in, in, in video game press, but it's visceral. Yes. It feels like you're connecting with stuff. They've they've streamlined the loadouts a lot and, and you're adding your weapon options and the different mods you can put on your weapons. All that feels very streamlined to me, so you have to think about that less. Right. You just feel like instead of figuring out which weapons to use, you're improving the weapons you want to use already. Um, and uh, so I think that, that definitely helps. Also streamlined is we don't have any of the resource mining, uh, any of the tedium before uh, that you had. Not, and I actually, I'm one of the few people who actually really, really like the resource mining. That was a lot of fun. I thought that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> It, I had a good time sense, doing that. It makes personally. sense in this story because yeah. you have such an imminent threat. You don't have time to go mining on some backwater planet. You just got to go out there and form this coalition. I guess so. Uh, one thing that I did notice, though, uh, is that when I'm skilling up, you know, when you're you're building up your different abilities, I'm feeling like the changes between the skill levels is kind of incremental. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling like I'm not seeing a big difference when I'm leveling up certain abilities. Maybe that will change over time as I get into you get into the the tree where it splits off and you can kind of choose to go. Like for example, more. Damage 
damage versus a, a wider AOE effect when I use my tech armor. Um, but I haven't seen much difference so, so far. So you did not import your Mass Effect 2 character? I didn't, no. Um, as, I, as I've mentioned in the past, I, I played Mass Effect 1 on Xbox, Mass Effect 2 on PC, and now I'm back on Xbox again. So right. I've never been able to import a character. I actually heard from Will Smith over at Tested that there is a way that you can take your Xbox saves onto PC, I think, but it's it's kind of a hack and it's a Pretty little bit kludgy. difficult and I didn't really want to deal with it. So I'm just going with my, I, I started a new character, kind of picked out her backstory based on what I had done in my previous Shepard. Picked the, you know, you either get to have Ashley or you get to have um, Caden. And uh, right. and so I, I, I used that same thing, did similar backstory. So I feel like I'm playing with the same character right. in a lot of ways and I'm making the same kind of choices. I'll tell you, on the PC side, it was awesome because uh, I forgot that there was even three different play modes because I never got that option. It just said, mm -hmm. import your old character. I'm like, yep. And then, and in fact, uh, uh, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler alert to say that Garrus is in Mass Effect 3. Oh, I love him so much. He's my favorite. Well, I, I played as female Shepard and I romanced Garrus. And so I'm going to romance Garrus. There's this cool moment where it's like, it has like, so you want to keep doing our thing? Our <laughs> awkward romance with an alien? Interspecies cross Aren't all the romancing a little bit awkward? Isn't I that guess, kind of part as, of the fun of it? Dude, the Garrus is the most awkward. Oh, it's hilarious. Man. He's studying up on like, I guess I tell a joke now. Eh? Yeah. So there's, there's some really great character interactions for sure. Um, I, I, I wish that I had been able to import my play from PC to Xbox because I did have a lot of great relationships that I'd like to see copied over. Mm -hmm. But I also, every every single person in my crew died on Mass Effect 2. So really? You basically, didn't save any of them? I think I saved like one person. I only lost one person. I didn't do very well, yeah, on that. Um, but the cutscenes and the characters are just phenomenal as always. I've noticed a little bit of jerkiness with some of the cutscenes that has been bothering me a little bit. So tell me, if, here's what I suspect it is. I think that the storytelling in, mm -hmm. in the Mass Effect series is so good that it's approaching an uncanny valley with video games. It's getting, where it's getting close enough to a narrative work of art like a, like a movie, mm -hmm. and as a result, we notice things. Normally, you don't care in a video game right. where did that gun come from. It was obviously in your inventory. Mm -hmm. But you do notice in all the cutscenes when all of a sudden you're like, well, she wasn't there before. And now, you know, where did that piece of equipment come from? <laughs> Which, again, all these are good things. It's it's less like that kind of... of um continuity issues and more like actual graphical issues that I'm seeing. Um, so maybe that's just a, a factor of, you know, I, I went back and installed both discs on my Xbox. Maybe that will help going forward. Uh -huh. um, but there was some jumpiness, a little jerkiness. Some of the facial features were a little funny. But I definitely am with you with the Uncanny Valley thing. It's it's approaching there. It's getting close. Which is great. It still looks this awesome, This is what though. we want. We're approaching yeah. a time when a video game can make you cry. By the way, how gut-wrenching was that? Oh, it's so they everything. They major balls oh, with it, dude. It was awesome. It's so much heart tugging and the strings of the heart tugging. I can't deal with it. <laughs> so one thing you've done that I haven't is you played multiplayer, right? Yes. Is it co-op or face-off? What is it? It's um, it, it's kind of like horde mode. It feels like horde mode from Gears of War. So you're okay. playing you're playing as a cooperative kind of survival mode. Um, you're trying to achieve certain tasks with your three other teammates. But these are isolated from the whole general story. You can't play through the actual no, story? No, you're starting your own multiplayer character. You can actually have multi multiple multiplayer characters that you can build up in, in, in like an RPG-like like setting. Okay. So you can, uh, they can have their own skills and abilities, their own name, their own uniform colors. Like I have an engineer and I have like an infiltrator, and so I'm playing as those guys and building them up separately. And they're good for different, you know, things within the multiplayer mode. Um, it's a lot of fun. It feels very. I, I mean, I know it's running on the Unreal Engine, you know, Unreal Engine three, right. and so of course it's going to have a little bit of that vibe to it. And it, it, there are some Gears of War moments. Like they're they're going to stomp you right in the thing. face. That's like fine. they will they will get you down. You try to get revived. No, they those geth are gonna stomp your face. So you can pick you can pick like what bad guys you wanna fight against if you wanna do like um uh, if you want to do Geth or if you want to do other alien species, you that, can now, do... Now, does it even bother to set up a narrative or it just loads the map? No, like, whatever they're... It's, yeah. yeah, no. Shoot, shoot Geth. Just, just kill them. Just get yeah. to your objectives and, and fight your way through. There's, like, waves. You get different waves. So you, you build up in difficulty. Also, it's, it's a little bit like a Left for Dead kind of experience. A little bit, yeah. And so yeah. at the end, when you get to wave 10, you get, like, these boss battles almost where you get, like, a couple of different mechs or you'll get a couple of different brutes at the same time. And so you're just kind of fighting to stay alive. And yeah, it is challenging. I was playing with uh, with Gary Witta and uh, Will and Norm from Tested. Oh my God! That's and great. we had we played for a few hours. We had the best time. It was really great. So it's one of my favorite multiplayers that I've actually experienced in a so long time. So obviously, when it comes down to it, we're all about either buy or don't buy. I think it's pretty obvious. Normally, I on this kind of thing, I'd say if you're a fan of the franchise, buy. But I'm going to say if you've never heard of Man of Mass Effect, buy. But don't buy this one. Go buy the first <laughs> one. Buy all 
of them. Yes, exactly. Yes, it's available now, Mass Effect 3, for $59.99. It's on PS3, Xbox 360, and PC as well. PC for the win. Mm -hmm. Hey, one of the signature elements of Bioware games is their ability to forge a romantic attraction between <laughs> you and other characters, and then, you know, take a trip to sexy town. We count down our top five characters from other franchises that we wish we could romance in this week's Lead Sheet. Video game characters we'd like to know, uh, you know, biblically. Alex Vance, Half-Life 2. In a world of lopsided eye candy, Alex is everything you can ask for in a post-apocalyptic sweetheart. She cracks jokes, cares about your safety. Even when you're about to walk into a facility crawling with stalkers, she has a fiery temper towards scumbags who betray the resistance. Oh, what I wouldn't have given to have stolen a moment in City 17, I'd say, Alex, if we die today, I just want you to know one thing. And then I'd lightly trace my pointer finger down her right cheek. My sentence would never quite be finished with words, but rather a frantic orchestra of zippers and grasping fingers would bring us to our ultimate conclusion. Oh, Alex. Number four, Ezio Adore da Firenze, Assassin's Creed 2. Who doesn't love a man with a sense of purpose? Take that dreamboat Ezio. He's a nobleman who also leads a secret life as part of an ancient order of assassins dating back centuries. His ruthless quest to murder members of the Templar Order is as brutal as it is precise. I can picture it now. I brush against him in a crowded marketplace. He's still covered in sweat from what was surely a dangerous yet successful mission. He touches my hand, letting me know the feelings are reciprocated. You know I'm married, he says. It doesn't matter. I'm down with OPA, other people's assassins. Jade, beyond good and evil. Let's be real here, folks. Dumb girls just lay there. You want a real roll in the hay? You need a lady with a head on her shoulders. Someone like Jade. Oh, Jade. Your close-cropped hair says I mean business, but your bright green lipstick says business might be a metaphor for sexy rubbing time. She exposed the government for the pigs they are and has a half pig for a best friend. And of course, she's a freelance photojournalist. Could be like a moonlit night on her island lighthouse. I look into her eyes and say, Tonight, let's leave the camera on. Number two, Nathan Drake from the Uncharted franchise. The flippant sense of humor of Patton Oswalt was Sir Edmund Hillary's adventurous spirit stapled on to Cary Grant's square jaw. Hello, Nate. Note to any man on the planet, look in the mirror every day and ask yourself this question. How can I be more like Drake? If I close my eyes for a moment, I can picture it. The sun setting on an Amazonian river while a rickety boat putters our way down to our rendezvous. Things start to get a little hot and heavy just as the first blow dart shatters the window of our cabin. They can wait, Drake, I say. There's so much to discover. Number one, Ryden. Sure you had a troubled childhood, but don't worry. Bri's here to take care of you. You know Raiden is a guy, right? She, she is? But what about the flowing hair and the butt-shaping bodysuit? Oh, his real name is Jack. Uh... I take Raiden. Sure, he's a complete psycho, but a half-cybernetic former child soldier ninja really puts a new spin on Ultimate Bad Boy. Sorry, Brian. Looks like you'll need to pick someone else. Unless, knowing he's a guy, you, you still want him on your list? Maybe. <laughs> All right. Now, for the record, the chat room is exploding right now. They're, They're like, mad. I'm going to punch a kitten if Laura Croft isn't number one on this list. But then other people were saying, Laura Croft and 3, 2, 1, fail. Like no, they didn't no. want Laura Croft. So I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, the thing is, you can't even blame Laura Croft for being like a bimbo because she's got the smarts, too. Oh, no, she's super smart. And the rockin' body. Yeah. Top well, I mean, this is movie. a list. We got this list from you guys. You helped on the Reddit. So yeah, that's true. If you don't true. like it, fact, it's your fault. Blame our Redditors, specifically Trivially Travis and Umbral Angel. If you have a better idea on who should get there, then tweet us to at TwitGameOn right now. Who did we miss? Laura we'll Croft it. also has a Laura mansion. Croft. A mansion? Yeah, she has a pretty sweet pad. Well, I mean, what are you, a gold digger? I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just pointing that out. I mean, you know, if you need a weekend getaway. Anywho, <laughs> in less than two years since the release of the beta, Minecraft has found an enviable hardcore fan base. Head honchos Jeb and Notch from Mojang are in town, and we stop by to talk all things craft. Today I'm joined by Jeb and Notch of Mojang, also known as the guys behind Minecraft. So what's new in Minecraft 1.2? I'll leave it to Jens. 
new lead. Oh, uh, we've added uh, cats and ocelots, and uh, we've added uh, uh, iron golems for the villages. Mm -hmm. And also we've increased the uh, uh, maximum build, build height to, to the double what it was before, so you actually got uh, three times the air space from the, from the ground level to build on. Um, I suppose yeah, th those are the main new features. Great. We were at the Microsoft Spring Showcase last week and we saw Minecraft for Xbox. Can you tell us what are some of the differences between what you'll be playing on Xbox versus the PC version? Um, well, one difference is that you will have split screen because that's more couch play friendly. Uh, and also the crafting will be a little bit different because it will have all the, all the recipes for you and it will tell you which you are able to create by, based on the uh, items you have in your inventory at the moment. Um, uh, otherwise, it, the, the m some differences is also that the Xbox version, the, the first uh, release will be based on the beta 1.6 and then it will catch up um, towards the PC version in updates that will come during the year. What's, is there any differences in the UI or how you actually build and, and handle the world? Um, no, not really. The, it, it's mainly the crafting that is different. Mm -hmm. So there's no difference between using a mouse versus using an Xbox controller? Is no. it difficult? Is it e easier to do, you think? Depends on if you're used to using a controller or not. If you play first-person shooters, it's like the same control. So. You guys just recently hit a huge milestone with over one million downloads of, of Minecraft for mobile. How has that been? Did you expect that kind of success in the mobile space? We were kind of hoping for it. Uh, we know that mobile games, games sell very well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they're usually cheaper and they're easier and accessible because of like the great way you can actually find and purchase store apps on them. But I'm uh, very excited about actually hitting one million. It's, it's, it's a huge like landmark. I'm, I'm always the pessimistic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very amazed, yes. <laughs> I haven't tried it myself. Is it difficult to, to utilize the tools within Minecraft from the small mobile you know, UI, or is it actually easier than you would expect? I mean, you can... Um, we don't have it yet, but we've done some experiments with like crafting, and that's easier with the touchscreen, mm. because you can just click it. But uh, like uh, actually navigating is somewhat difficult on a mobile phone compared to like uh, if you have an actual controller. So we we tried solving that as good as we can. So in the in the mobile version, we actually have like auto jumping when you run into a to a ledge, so you don't have to like manually jump all the time. So what's the most impressive thing you've seen built in the mobile version of Minecraft? Oh, I haven't really. It must be the Korean community. Oh, yes, we do. The, we we. Actually, I don't know who made it, but it was it, it just said Korean Community Pocket Edition, and yes. it was, there was like a uh, what a medley of lots of cool builds mm. in, in, on the Pocket Edition, and that was really impressive, I must say. Yeah, and they had texture packs. Yeah, yeah. We don't really even support we, we, we that version, no. <laughs> so that's that's pretty amazing. Yeah. So I'm a Minecraft newbie myself. I, I just signed in. I've been practicing with some of our our you know chat realm members. And uh, what advice do you have for me? What should I do first when I get into the game? Well, start playing multiplayer. I think that's uh, probably the most fun you can have, uh, unless you really don't like multiplayer. But uh, mm -hmm. once you're in multiplayer, it kind of becomes this more social experience, which is really fun. And just uh, play multiplayer and like set some random goal. Like we we're gonna get diamond, and then just try doing that. Why do you think Minecraft has been such a cultural phenomenon? Why do you think it has taken off with gamers in such a really big way? Uh, I don't really know. I tried analyzing it, but it's kind of hard since I'm kind of in the middle of like creating it. It's very hard to understand why. Um, I guess in in a sense, it's kind of this like uh, dream story about uh, one person making a game that really takes off and that kind of becomes a thing. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, very hard for me to kind of see why exactly. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the, the cultural impact is based most uh, much on the popularity of, of the game. Mm. And why the game is so popular, that, that's also something that can be discussed for a long time. But mm. uh, we, we talked about it yesterday that the, uh, people like often like editors and, and such in games, but Minecraft is the only only game where editing is part of the game. It's not like you switch between edit mode and play mode. You actually play and edit at the same time, mm. and I think uh, it, it, uh, it inspires people to, to play the game and invite their friends, and then it becomes bigger and so on. Yes. If someone has never seen Minecraft before, never played it before, how would you describe it to them? Well, I usually just say, 
it's a world made out of like one meter cubes, which I don't know in American terms, like 16 billion feet. I don't um, <laughs> Roughly. I don't, I don't know. The, I don't know the conversion. Uh, and you can pick up any of them and place them and get materials from them and build tools and fight monsters. So that's basically it. There's no no real goal. There is a goal, but it's, yeah, it's not expressed in the game. Now, what is what would you say is the ultimate goal then? Well, there there's a dragon you get to fight. The dragon. So there's a dragon. Yeah, I, 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 I usually explain the game as a sandbox game, but that doesn't really help if you don't know what a sandbox game no. is. So it's a, it's, a, it's a toy, I suppose, mm. and it lets you set your own goals. Every mm. game needs a good dragon at the end. Yeah, yeah. that's true. I think. Yeah. I think that's the pinnacle of, of you have completed your quest. <laughs> yes. You get to murder the dragon. Dragon didn't ask for it. No, no, it's an innocent dragon. He's an innocent dragon. We explicitly made it innocent to Minecraft. Really? <laughs> no, it's, re it's, really, it's really nasty. <laughs> yeah. It probably did something. I, I guess it's probably... Yeah, what's his backstory? It's, Can it's, we invent uh, a backstory for sure. him right now? Sure, he, uh, he murdered your parents. <gasps> yes. With fire, dragon fire. Yes. Is this... You're telling me that he murdered my parents just now? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. On camera? I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. I'll live. Um, so let's move on to our lightning round, which is questions from our viewers. And uh, the first one comes from Sir Chito. And he asks, capes. Will we ever see more capes, like the ones you gave out at Minecon? And he also goes on to say, you'll be releasing Minecraft on the Xbox soon. Do you plan to make the game available on any more consoles, like the Nintendo Wii or the PlayStation? Well, for capes, I don't think we know what we're going to do with them yet. Uh, this, uh, the first step with capes is that we are going to make it possible to choose. Uh, if you have a cape now, we will going to make it possible to choose to not use the cape in your profile where, when you choose your skin and mm. such. And after we have that, then we'll, it will be possible to add capes, uh, multiple capes for one player, and then they can choose in the profile which one they want to use. Mm. And when that is working, then we'll see a lot more capes, I believe. Okay. Uh, so we're probably not going to see it on other consoles soon because uh, we signed a very good agreement with Microsoft to get it on the Xbox. Ah, fair enough. Yes. Mm -hmm. The next question comes from the Necromancer. He says, any plans for more Mojam-style events in the future? Oh, uh, Mojam was a 60-hour game jam. And a game jam is where you like focus to start from scratch and make a game in a very short period mm -hmm. of time. Uh, and this time, Mojam was a live-streamed uh, game jam for charity where people would uh, donate to a charity to get the game once it was completed. And we did it together with uh, two other in indie developers, the Wolf Wolfire yes. and the uh, Oxai Game Studio. The question was if we were going to do anything else. Yeah. We <laughs> another <laughs> <I suppose>. one? <laughs> Sorry? Another one? Or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we thought it was really fun, but we don't we haven't planned it. No, I would love to. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> the next question comes from Velirno. He says, I work with kids with autism and behavioral issues, and the really functional cases have gotten into the game and really get a lot out of exploring and creating. However, they wouldn't be able to do anything if I, a long-term player, wasn't there to explain how to play. Mm. I'm just wondering how far off a proper tutorial slash in-game encyclopedia is for new, new gamers. I don't think we have any plans for, to do anything like no, that. No. <laughs> not even for the kids with autism? Especially not. No. <laughs> <laughs> no I think... Um, Doing something like that means you have to keep it updated all the time. I mean, we could, probably, if we did something like that, we'd probably make it like you automatically get the stuff from the Wikipedia that, or the wiki that the, the players update. Mm -hmm. But then we run into trouble with like vandalism. Like if someone posts a really inappropriate picture that there and it appears in the game, then we're kind of re responsible for that. Have you considered, or will you ever consider, re-implementing Minecraft in a major game engine like Unreal Engine, CryEngine, etc.? Java seems to have the advantage of being able to run on a very wide range of computers, which has definitely helped their success, but I'm wondering why you aren't thinking bigger. And this comes from Beats for the Mind. Uh, I don't think those engines would be able to run Minecraft, because uh, we, those are made for static environments, more or less. Um, I mean, in the, the cry engine, you can kind of destroy trees and stuff like that, but you can't really dig tunnels. And, uh, and they are really made for, like, you design a level that you kind of compile it so it runs very fast. Whereas in Minecraft, everything is dynamic. So we kind of have to have our own engine for that. Uh, so, yeah. I think we are thinking big if we're not using those. Mm. Yeah. Gotcha. All right, and the next question comes from Dark Demon 42 Can you ask Mojang to comment on the bucket people being hired and how far away the modding API is? Um, the, the bucket team uh, were hired because they have a, done uh, an 
unofficial server with uh, modding support, at least on the, in the multiplayer and server part. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also have a, have a like, multiplayer optimization um, uh, style. <laughs> That's not the word I was looking for, but it uh, works, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, our plan now is to uh, make the official Minecraft server catch up with Bucket uh, to have a server-side modding. And after that, allow for for client-side modding, which means adding your own models and uh, textures and, uh, and client-side effects. Um, and uh, I, I don't really know when it will be out, but we have decided uh, that um, the next update, 1.3, won't be released until we have something bucket equi equivalent on the server side. Can you comment on some of the, the ire from the modding community about this acquisition? Well, yeah, I think um, I really don't know how to comment that. I think um, I understand why some people uh, would be upset by it, but on, on the other hand, I don't kind of understand it because either we would do it ourselves, or we would team up with one of the big ones, and Bucket is definitely one of the big ones. Um, so, yeah. I think uh, I've seen lots of positive comments as well. I think there's just a few that's been like negative or upset about it. The vocal mm. negative portion. Yeah, I mean, there are a few like uh, that have been doing their own thing and they feel kind of cheated, and I understand that. It's not our intention to do that. We just have to have to pick one. Mm. Gotcha. Where do you see Minecraft in the next 10 years? 10 years, wow. Uh, I'm really hoping for the modding to really take off and like see some like spin-offs made from by other people. Um, I mean, the coolest thing that could happen would be like something like Counter-Strike, what they did for Half-Life. I mean, something that really like takes the thing and makes something new from it. It would be really cool to see something like that. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for joining us today, and we can't wait to see what you guys work on next. All right, head on over to Minecraft.net for all the info on the game. While you're at it, get in the fast lane, Grandma. The show's almost over, but we still got a few bullets left in the gun. We're going to get the inside scoop on Mass Effect 3 straight from the source. Associate producer Billy Buskell joins us. Plus, Veronica visits an old classic on her iPad. Can she resist just one more turn from civilization? But first, in case you're not aware of how commerce works, words are used to identify sponsors who pay for this show. Take this episode of Game On is brought to you by Ford, featuring Curve Control. Curve Control is part of a whole suite of safety technologies on the 2013 Ford Taurus. It helps drivers maintain control of their vehicle when they're taking a curve too quickly. Here's how it works. Curve Control is always looking for potential problems by measuring how quickly the vehicle's turning versus how quickly you're trying to turn it. It pays attention to the roll rate, yaw rate, lateral acceleration, wheel speed, a steering angle, all this stuff I don't even understand. The point is it runs 100 calculations every second. When it finds a problem, it'll rapidly reduce engine torque, it'll apply four-wheel braking, it'll slow the vehicle up to 10 miles an hour in one second, and it works on dry or wet pavement. Curve Control helps protect you while driving on curves, and it's one of several new driver assist technologies available on the 2013 Ford Taurus. You can find out more at Ford.com slash cars slash Taurus. All right, well, we are very lucky to be joined by Billy Buskell, who is an associate producer on Mass Effect 3. Billy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, guys. And thank you for uh, hanging out during the show earlier, too. <laughs> um, so my first question is, for those who haven't been involved in the, in the Mass Effect universe before, can you kind of tell us where we're picking up on the storyline? Uh, yeah, this is basically, uh, you know, the culmination of the, this giant war that Shepard and company have uh, been building towards. So, you know, the Reapers have kind of landed at Earth. They're getting ready to, you know, basically rain down on the entire galaxy. And so Commander Shepard starts out on Earth uh, and is kind of getting ready to rally the troops against the Reapers, you know, this huge alien sentient race. Uh, so he's he's kind of on this huge mission now to go and rally the forces of the galaxy to say, you know, this is our final stand. So when you play the game, you got action mode, story mode, and RPG mode. How does that affect your actual gameplay experience? For somebody who hasn't approached the franchise before, how do you explain to them the different modes? Uh, you know, if you're a, you're already a Mass Effect player, I think uh, you'd probably want to look at RPG mode. That's kind of our core Mass Effect experience. Um, for anyone who's new, who's you know maybe more geared towards action, doesn't want to make, necessarily make every single choice, but still wants to be able to make some of the big choices in the game, uh, we have action mode there, uh, which is you know really cool. Kind of adds uh, a little bit higher tempo to everything. 
Uh, and then we also have story mode, which is really good for those who really want to come in, enjoy the narrative, uh, but don't necessarily want to be you know bogged down with the combat. So it's a, you know a little bit easier to get through the combats and uh, and kind of progress through the actual narrative of the story we're telling. So one of the things that I've really enjoyed so far is the multiplayer. What 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 made you decide to bring multiplayer into the universe for the first time? Uh, you know, Mass Effect has always been a franchise where we've looked at multiplayer and said, you know, is this something we could do? Um, and it never really quite made the right fit for what the narrative we were trying to tell at that time. So, you know, we looked at it in Mass Effect 1, we looked at it in Mass Effect 2, and there, there wasn't really a cohesive experience that we could create with the narrative and with, uh, with multiplayer. Uh, but this time we, we kind of came into the game and said, we're about to create a game that tells a story about this final epic war uh, between these factions. And, uh, you know, Shepard has his story, you know, he's off finding the troops, but as he's doing that, there's these other little kind of side stories that are happening with these groups of operatives uh, that are driving, you know, uh, other battles where Shepard can't be all the time. So uh, it made a real good experience uh, choice for us to say, you know, we can bring a cooperative experience and, uh, you know, and and have fun with your friends and, and share that experience and help fight off the Reaper threat. So one thing I've been trying to figure out when you're playing multiplayer, um, does, does the kind of influence you have in, in your fight to get the galactic reputation, does that change depending on what kind of modes you choose or what kind of, of people you're fighting against, whether it's Geth or, or whether it's, you know, and any of the different groups that you can battle against in multiplayer? Does that, does that change how things go in, in the storyline or is it all just kind of spread out evenly? Uh, it, it's fairly spread out. Um, the choices you make in multiplayer are more to do with, uh, you know, what kind of potential bonuses you could line up. So if you if you play, you know, the random faction or the random location, you can get get little uh, multiplier bonuses there that are very helpful for building up uh, your war assets. Uh, but as far as the story is told, there, uh, no, each area can actually be attacked several times by by different areas, and it's really important to actually go back and revisit those areas in multiplayer uh, because your your N7 rating there can actually, your galactic readiness can change over time. So um, it is really important to kind of go back to those theaters of war and explore and, and make sure that, you know, you haven't lost ground back to the Reapers as a result. So uh, in Mass Effect 3, the stream, uh, you've obviously streamlined the handling of weapons and armor in there. What brought about that streamlining? Uh, you know, we've got a lot of feedback uh, following Mass Effect 1 and Mass Effect 2, and it's something we, we pay very close attention to. Uh, so as we came out of Mass Effect 2, uh, we kind of heard that you know folks wanted a little bit more customization with weapons and armor. Um, you know, so we brought back things like uh, the, the cool armors, but you know, a lot of folks mentioned they wanted to have helmets that could be detached from those, those cool iconic armors. Uh, so we brought that in. And, um, and then for the weapons... We really wanted something that felt a little more, you know, tangible. We wanted something where you, you feel like, you know, I'm going to take this scope, I'm going to attach it to this weapon, and really customize it to my style or to my uh, my character. So uh, we really kind of wanted to have that, that weapon bench be like this much more uh, in-fiction uh, feeling of how you're actually going to modify that weapon and bring it into your next battle. I am wearing my somewhat incongruous uh, Kingdoms of Amalur armor <laughs> in Mass nice. Effect 3. <laughs> It's got like the spiky shoulder pads and everything. It's it's oh, the, like it's the Dragon great. Age armor, right? It, kind of, yeah, it's a similar in idea. Yeah, 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 sure. And probably similar in style as well. I think I had that armor as well. I, I love anyway. I love the fact that they uh, they had the Dragon Age armor, but they attributed it to being a sports team. And it's like, you've got the Dragon. It was logo a similar kind of story yeah. in this one. Um, so as I was mentioning earlier in the show, um, I did not import my Shepard, my Fem Shep from Mass Effect Two. I'm curious to know how the gameplay experience differs from someone like me who would have lost like all of their crew. How different is the main quest line, the main storyline, if you've had a very traumatic end to your Mass Effect 2? Uh, you know, not to go too far into spoiler territory, but uh, yeah, the, the narrative will change. And, and whoever comes out of that will potentially be there for you or not. Um, we have some folks that, you know, kind of stand in in their place. But generally, you know, depending on who comes out of Mass Effect 2's ending, that'll, that'll have a large impact on who's there to support your efforts, you know, in the, the, the galactic war with the Reapers now. So. so it is amazing to me, writing a third chapter of this, this conclusion, it's, it's, it's got to be an amazing, epic undertaking. And so has the course of the entire Mass Effect story been determined in advance, or is it something that you guys sort of make it up as you go along? Or did you, did you, is this the beginning of a, or the end of a plan that you had from the beginning? Uh, we were actually pretty fortunate, you know, when when the franchise was announced back in uh, 2005, 
you know, the core leads had already kind of built uh, this idea that we were going to be a trilogy right from the onset. So we were investing, you know, a certain amount of effort there and a certain amount of story that we were going to tell. And so we had these over, you know, overarching arcs that we were going to use and say, this is, you know, Commander Shepard's story, you know, from beginning to end. Um, but it was, it was still fairly loose. It was, it was a high-level document of what we wanted to achieve through each of the games and how we'd build towards this grand finale. Um, but we left a lot of wiggle room there. So there was a lot of uh, space to kind of be agile and move around. Uh, as we got feedback coming out of Mass Effect 1 and into Mass Effect 2, we could adjust a little bit there. And then as we come out of Mass Effect 2 going to 3, we were able to, again, you know, tweak and, and make changes based on that feedback. But so, uh, yeah, yeah, it was something we had kind of a, a good framework for from the beginning. So it seems like as you progress through the story, obviously when you lose a character or when you make a decision, you, you close certain doors. Uh, is it a case where as you progress forward through the games, more and more of the content is created knowing that, that certain players will never even have the option to hear it? Because obviously you have to account for an increasingly wide amount of choices. Yeah. Uh, we, we joke it's an expensive way to make a game for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, but that that really is the, one of the core pillars of what we, we try to achieve with that Bioware is, is we want that really strong element of choice. We want you to have that experience that really caters to what your play style is, what your shepherd is. Uh, we hear it a lot and you know from fans and from you know reviewers is they often refer to Shepherd as my shepherd. And, and I think that's one of the really cool things we get out of uh, the feedback from the fans is that everyone's right is what shepherd is to them could be very different from what shepherd is to me to a friend to a coworker, to another fan so um we have to kind of give enough breadth there that everybody can have that uh, experience that they can call their own uh, but you also have to have enough that you can kind of tie it back eventually to you know a single story so it's funny. I even find it disturbing just hearing people refer to Shepard as he. Oh, yeah. No, like every time I hear it, I'm like, what are you, who, who, who are you talking about? Um, so you may have heard Brian and I discussing earlier about how, how different the combat is feeling. What have you done to change the combat? And uh, is that something that you've, you've taken advantage of with the Unreal Engine? Yeah, we have, a, we have an amazing team here in Edmonton. Um, you know, Corey Gasper and, and Eric Pangon and Brennan. We, these guys basically jumped in and said, how can we change... Uh, the combat, how we make Shepard more fluid. And, and so that was a challenge we kind of set out at the very beginning of the the, the project. And so, you know, you'll notice now that Shepard is much more agile. There's dive rolls. There's the ability to kind of move from piece of cover to cover without really kind of leaving cover. So we have, you know, SWAT turns. We have uh, the ability to kind of transfer from one co low cover to high cover. And all of that's to kind of allow Shepard to be a little bit more fluid, a little bit more agile, and, and kind of take better control of the battlefield. Uh, and then, you know, from the, the powers side, you know, guys like Eric and, and Bjorn and our team, the gameplay team and Manvir uh, in Montreal, they're, you know, working to make sure that we have a whole new set of powers that are, you know, easy to explore uh, and fun to have, you know, to really push and, and see what those combos look like. So uh, if you haven't seen yet, but we have a lot of biotic combos, tech combos that create some really awesome results. And if you're playing multiplayer, it's a hell of a lot of fun to play. So, hmm. so uh, I'm still early in the game, and so I'm going to ask for a reverse spoiler here. And I say reverse spoiler because I want to know who's romanceable, or more importantly, who shall I not bother to put my smooth moves on? <laughs> oh, um, you know, I, I think that might actually get into a bit spoiler territory, but basically, you know, Shepard does have a, quite a, a wide crew on the, the Normandy now, so... It's best to talk to everybody and see who you really enjoy uh, having those conversations with and who do you want to build a relationship with uh, and, and kind of see where it goes from there. So let's talk about the DLC for a minute. That's something we've been discussing a lot on the show. Uh, some people, myself included, uh, I, I don't want to say at one point because I still kind of feel that way, were a little bit rankled by the fact that they felt that not doing the DLC would take away from the core storyline and, and would cause you to lose a potential crew member that could be very valuable going forward. What did you guys... Like, what do you say to that? And and what was the process of of coming up with DLC so early in the in the lifetime of this game? Uh, you know, basically, what we had is we finished the game, and and we kind of go into a, a phase where we're going through you know a significant amount of bug fixing as we prep for manufacturing. As we get into that mode, uh, you know, various team members are able to free up and, and take on different bits of work. And so we started to prep uh, in those final three months before we launched the game to start work on From Ashes. Um, and, and that's kind of basically where that, that started. Um, we'd always had an idea that we might want to explore uh, more, uh, more crew members, but ultimately we couldn't fit it 
Uh, and we were lucky that we had some, some of the assets kind of pre-built so that we could actually build it. But uh, yeah, that, that whole DLC pack was basically something that we said, hey, you know what, we have some time, let's work on something really cool uh, and put that out for the fans and, and let them make the choice. Um, and that's really what it is. It's another choice. If you want it, it's an amazing piece of content. Uh, but it won't actually, you know, hurt the game if you don't have it. So if you opt it, you say, nope, that's not for me. Uh, I don't really want to have that experience right now. Um, it won't hurt your ending. Uh, but if you do go and pick it up, it definitely will add a new flavor. And it's, it's a very interesting uh, squad member for sure. So. so, okay, I can't find my new crew member. <laughs> where where do I find my crew member? I'm having this You problem. got the DLC and you don't know where to I go. I don't to know where to go it. to find You're the asking crew for a straight yeah. up. Like, I just want to know. I just I, I have the guy's attention. I might as well ask go him. Ahead. So where do, where do I find her? him? Uh I don't want to go into the exact location because that is definitely a spoiler, but he is definitely out there. Uh you'll out have there. to spend a little bit of time before you kinda of get the, the whereabouts of where his location is. I will but, get some uh, kind of alert. Someone yes, will yeah, let me yeah. know. You'll, you'll definitely get the heads up that uh, some some anomaly has been discovered. All right, fair All enough. All right, well, here's the real <laughs> question that everyone wants to know. Seriously, this is an epic conclusion to the story. Is it the conclusion with a capital C? Is this really the end of the Mass Effect franchise? Uh, you know what? It, it's a pretty big universe, and <laughs> I don't think we'd ever say. I don't think we'd go with never say never. Um, this is certainly the, the conclusion of the trilogy with uh, Commander Shepard right now. Um, but given, you know, like I said, it's a huge universe that we've built over the last few years. Um, so yeah, I think we have some, uh, some more space to explore down the road. All right, Billy, thank you so, so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate you taking the time on this Sunday evening to talk with us and, uh, where can people follow you online? Uh, you know, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's, uh, alien. So E H L I E N, uh, it's my clever way of spelling alien in Canadian language. So. <laughs> alien. I like alien. that. Alright, well there are games that are good and then there are games that change the way you view the world. This week Veronica suffers from delusions of grandeur in this week's Abdiction. <sighs> Do you smell that? Tell me you smell that. It's fear and it's love and it's hope and it's the dreams of everyone, all distilled into one hot breath. Everything worth living for and dying for. Do you know why I called you up here today? It's time. It's time we took back this civilization, and I'm the one to do it. Take a look out there. I never thought I'd be the one to control the destiny of everyone, but then I played Civilization Revolution for iOS, and I know I'm the woman for the job. It's easy to play. Just choose one of 16 civilizations, all with their own unique specialties and abilities. Drag your finger across the screen to move units and to zoom in and out. If you're a fan of the series, you'll immediately know how to use the controls. If not, the tutorials are very helpful. Sure, graphics aren't amazing, but the depth of gameplay is really good. Soon I was conquering cities through technology and might, stacking military units for more power. I played in the sandbox mode, and then the scenarios. I spent hours learning every nuance of what it's like to be the benevolent god this world deserves. I've played the console before, but then I was just in my apartment, playing with toy soldiers and watching my cat get fatter. Now it's in my hands, and the universe explodes with possibilities. When I wisely use the scientific advancements of my wise men to feed my people and grow them strong, in line at the Panera Bread, I understand that there is no difference. Same when I trade with foreign empires during office meetings, or mercilessly slice the throats of invading armies while on public transportation. It's so clear, there is only one solution. This civilization deserves Veronica Belmont, and I deserve this civilization. Revolution is upon us. (laughs) 
General Cat. <laughs> Dude, I will vouch for <laughs> Civ Revolution. It yes. is it is ninety percent of the civilization experience. I play it at the gym all the time. It makes ninety minutes of elliptical go by just like that. It's incredible. I also find that Downton Abbey does the same thing. <laughs> Fair enough. Anyway, Civilization Revolution is available for six ninety nine on iOS, and uh, my cat Devo is not for sale. Don't. Don't. <laughs> Glenn Rubenstein is the producer and host of Shut Up and Play, the Twitland Party. It's a program where tonight we will all play Minecraft with anyone else who wants in. Why look, if it isn't Glenn Rubenstein now to discuss Shut Up and Play. Hello. Hey, what's up, everybody? I am indeed Glenn Rubenstein, producer and co-host of Shut Up and Play, and tonight, Sunday, March 11th, we have Minecraft, also with some rock band action going on. If you want to get in on Minecraft, go to the chat room Twit Live 3 on the Twit IRC server. And next week, Sunday, March 18th, Trackmania is back. We are doing Trackmania Nations Forever, which is a free game that you can download and play along with us on the PC, as well as Trackmania 2 Canyons. If you want to RSVP for that, send an email to twitlamparty at gmail.com, and we will see you next Sunday here on Shut Up and Play. Oh, and by the way, everyone... Glenn said I could say his name however I want. Yeah. It can be Steen, Steen it can be Stein. He's Ambestinuous. <laughs> Ambestinuous. By the way, Glenn, I'm sorry for talk blocking you last time. I had him put talk in the block. teleprompter. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That, to, to let him let, talk. Let Glenn talk. <laughs> Speaking of which, hey, have you guys checked out Doghouse Systems yet? They make some of the most kick assingest gaming machines the money can buy. How do we know? Because we get to play them every week during the LAN party, and they truly do kick ass. There was an ass that walked by. Boom. Boom. Kicked. Kicked. So when you're ready to level up, use code GAMEON at checkout, and they'll double your memory for free. Click on the banner ad at our Twit homepage to learn more about the Double Your Memory promotion. All right, well, we have finally done it. Your tweets have finally brought well-deserved attention to OMG Chad and his army of opinions. Chad 2012. <laughs> Let's hear from the man right now. Hey, hey Chad. Thanks. Hey, so uh, Mr. Maxilonson, I can't really pronounce <laughs> usernames at all, says, looks like the new iPad is a pretty legit gaming console. Makes me completely forget about the PS Vita hashtag Chad 2012. Oh. <laughs> you guys excited about the iPad? Dude, as a gaming I'm telling you, console? man, once, once, once people change the way they expect to interact, I mean, I'll, I have said this before, the only thing that Vita has going for it is physical controls. Once we move beyond it, and if they're so important, then they'll be a peripheral. I'm telling you, iPad gaming is where it's going to be. I think we need to see some more peripherals. I think that's truly what I'm waiting for. Yeah. I just I think there will always be a need to have some kind of analog control. Like I love like touchscreen is great. Touchscreen works for a lot of things, right. but there are just some types of gameplay where I want to have a controller in my hand. Yeah, I can't imagine playing something like a Street Fighter Two type game on an iPad. I mean, there, there's been plenty of shooters, but they just don't play as easily or as you know, it's the the interaction isn't as good as you get with a controller. Yeah, get out there, make some Bluetooth peripherals, all you geniuses yeah. out there. And then uh, also Troy Hutch says, remember Sim City Societies? It was the last uh, Sim game. Uh, it was made without Will Wright and Maxis, uh, and it was horrible. Aww. So he doesn't seem don't that excited. Sin. We don't need your negativity around He's here. We believe excited. in Sim City. All right, well, it's going to be awesome. If what we've seen so far is any indication, considering it's not coming out until 2013, mm -hmm. I think they've got some time for polish. They've got a little bit of time. Oh, right. I'm, I'm keeping Sims my hope and keeping my hope alive. And then uh, finally, uh, Total Dial 95 says, "How about Shell from Portal from the Portal series <gasps> for the lead sheet?" Okay. Okay. Also, oh Chad, my God. Chad for twenty twin. Now the weird thing is, is, is you never even see Shell. She, she doesn't. Well, you see say, her. Well, you kind of. You see her. You see her through other walls. If you, if you get your portals just right, you can kind of see her coming talk. in and out. Like she's not a real person. How that, you, you don't think that's kind of sexy you know in its that's, own way? That's how you romance yourself. Is that you make up two portals and then you lean in and you oh, kiss yourself. Oh, you just went to the romancing you. yourself. Okay, <laughs> Chad. Anything else? Uh, there's a whole bunch of feedback. Thank you everyone for uh, for uh, sending in stuff. But that's about it for me. So uh, back to you guys. All right. Well, a huge thanks to Jeb and Not from Mojang and Billy Buskell from Bioware. Next week, Felicia Day from the Guild, Never Eureka, and Doctor Horrible Sing Along Blog joins us to talk about all sorts of interesting and we'll things. And will prove that they're two different people because you'll see them both on the show at the same time or will we oh wait that's or a, will we that's an idea for a bit see you guys then bye guys love you Bird, shoe, shoe hummingbird. Are you telling me? Shut your face. <laughs> adorable humming. Hey, what did I just say to you? Look at that adorable hummingbird. It's so adorable. <laughs>
<laughs> Shut up, bird. It's right there. It's <laughs> my shot. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this little turd bird screwing up my shot. Turd singing bird. and while I'm trying to read my lines. <laughs> Get out of here, bird. Hey, boo. He's over there now. He's just moving around. He's trying to be a smart ass. Oh, he's being so adorable. <laughs> there you go. Sorry. What did you do? He shook the tree. He's over there now. Singing in. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> he's taunting me. He's a troll bird. Totally troll bird. God, bird. Okay. No, no. He knows to shut his face. I'll come get him. <laughs> I'll come get him. <laughs> In their tongue, he's Dovahkiin. Dragonborn. Oh my god. <laughs> Was that a blast of air? Yeah, that was Apparently, like an air cannon? Oh my god, that's Dovahkiin. awesome. Dovahkiin. Dragonborn. Oh! <laughs> that, is that real? Veronica, don't tell Brian, but we're going to do this to him next week. <laughs> oh, dude. Spoiler I, I'm okay with that, as long as I explain on the soft plate. <laughs>